Hello and welcome to this month's Royal New Zealand College of Urgent Care CME podcast interview. My name is Guy Melrose. As technology advances, the cost barrier to accessing point-of-care ultrasound, or POCUS, is coming down. But what is POCUS? What can it add to our clinical practice? And is it something we should be using in urgent care? Okay, so I'd like to welcome to the Royal New Zealand College of Urgent Care's podcast, Dr. Kelvin Ward. Kelvin is a fellow of the Royal New Zealand College of Urgent Care and medical director of the Wellington Accident and Urgent Medical Centre down in New Zealand's capital, down in Wellington. And he's going to be talking on our podcast today because of a special interest that he's developed over the last few years in point of care ultrasound. And this is a growing uh, medium for us to use um, in the future going forwards. And he's really taken the ball by the horns and, and got stuck in with uh, with becoming trained and um, experienced in this. So th- welcome to the podcast, Kelvin. Thank you for talking to us today. Oh, thanks very much for having me, Guy. It's a pleasure. Now, if we start with um, point of care ultrasound or POCUS, as it's often shortened to, when somebody asks you about POCUS in urgent care, how do you describe it to them? How do you how do you kind of um, describe what you do and what it is? Well, uh, the, the definition or my definition of point of care ultrasound is the use of ultrasound by the attending clinician. So that's the doctor seeing the patient at, and uh, the use of ultrasound by them at the bedside. And what you're really doing is trying to answer some binary questions, some yes and no questions about that patient, which will help you guide decision-making about that patient's treatment and disposition. Ultrasound, we're obviously familiar with because we refer patients for formal ultrasounds from a radiology department. Um, But what you're doing isn't formal radiology. So how does POCUS differ to... um, to, to, to the formal radiology that we're probably more familiar with. Yeah, sure. Well, well, POCUS is is essentially a f- it's a focused test. So you're really only a, uh, aiming to answer those specific yes and no questions. Um, sometimes it's been described as an extension of the physical physical examination, but it's really an an augmentation of that physical examination where you're trying to narrow the differential diagnosis through answering specific questions. And that's distinct from a formal or comprehensive radiology scan. Uh, We're we're really just sort of focusing down on on a particular question we want to ask, answer. And that may be, does the patient have an uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm? Does the patient have gallstones? Uh, does the patient have a DVT? So we're really just answering specific questions. I think in one of the talks you've given in at the Goodfellow Symposium on this, you described it as a, almost like an extension of the stethoscope. It's like a tool um, in that regard for, mm. for answering specific questions. And I quite like imagining it in my head in, in that sort of way. Mm. It comes, uh, in my mind, after the physical examination. So it's not part of the physical examination, but it it follows the history and the examination, which allows you to form a clinical impression or a differential diagnosis. And once you form that differential diagnosis based on your clinical impression, then the the use of of point-of-care ultrasound allows you to, to narrow down that differential by... Uh, ruling in or ruling out uh, specific uh, diagnoses or questions that have been raised by that differential. So, how did you discover point of care ultrasound? What was your? How did you become interested in it? What was it that made you think this is something I need to do? Well, it was. Uh, I think in two thousand and twelve, um, I arranged a CME session for the doctors who work at our clinic. Our clinic has. Uh, up to 200 doctors on our roster made up of both urgent care and general practice doctors. Uh, And we had some of the emergency physicians from the local hospital come and talk uh, on a variety of topics. And one of those topics was um, 
by Scott Bowman, who's the Director of Emergency Ultrasound at Wellington ED. And he described how they use ultrasound in the ED. And it was really an epiphany moment for me, even though the cases were maybe those that you wouldn't typically see in the urgent care setting. Uh, I, I could really see how this could be so useful in, in my practice uh, with uh, helping to rule in or rule out diagnoses that were part of my differential. Um, and so from there, I, the following year, I did a course that Scott runs, a two-day course that he runs every year in Wellington, and subsequently enrolled on the Otago um, point of care ultrasound course that's a one-year course run through the Ota University of Otago um, and from there the rest is history but prior to that uh, that talk in 2012 I don't think I'd even heard of point of care ultrasound uh, certainly wasn't aware of the extent it was used in the emergency department. Um, am I right in saying that it's now a part of a emergency department training. The the FASM training now includes it as, as as a requirement now for ED. I believe so. I believe this year it's uh, been formalised within the requirements of the emergency medicine training within Australasia. And for uh, a number of years, um, it has been a requirement for emergency medicine training uh, in the United States. It's one of their uh, core requirements for fellowship. So it's a, a very much a, an evolving specialty, the point of care ultrasound. And indeed, if anyone listened to us talking with Dinesh Dionarain up in Everest, they were using it up there um, because of the flexibility of using it. Um, the point of view of your use of it within the urgent care setting, how is it, um, how is it adapted to urgent care scope of practice and what do you specifically use it for within an urgent care clinic? Sure well I, th I think it's uh, the scope of uh, point of care ultrasound and urgent care is very similar to the way it's used in the emergency department. Uh, the applications that I use it for are almost identical. The, the difference being that we see a different subset of patients. Uh, we don't see major trauma for example and and generally the presentations in urgent care are less acute however the type of scans we're doing are the same and the questions we're asking are the same so it's used uh, basically anywhere in the body you can use ultrasound there's an application for it but the common applications would be looking at the heart to answer questions about uh, left ventricular function uh, to uh, answer questions about whether it was a pericardial effusion, whether the signs of right heart strain. We use ultrasound to look at the lungs, to rule in or out pneumothoraces, to look for pneumonia, pleural effusions. Uh, the, in the abdomen, uh, we're looking at the aorta, at the gallbladder for the presence of gallstones, the kidney for presence of hydronephrosis as a marker of renal colic, uh, early pregnancy, DVT, uh, the, the list just goes on and on. So within each of those applications, there are specific binary questions that we're looking to answer. And you mentioned briefly at the beginning about the difference between formal ultrasound from a radiologist and, mm. and, and POCUS. Um, how confident are you that in your abilities to determine some of this pathology, given the training that you've been through? Is it, I guess my question would be is it a is it it is it a safe thing for us to be doing and mm. the follow-up to that would be what do the radiology departments feel about this being done in, in an urgent care setting mm. well it's a it's a big topic um <clears throat> point of care ultrasound has certainly been extensively studied uh, especially in the emergency medicine literature and across a wide range of applications it's been shown to be in the hands of emergency physicians uh, trained in point of care ultrasound to be very sensitive and specific uh, for a wide range of different conditions. Uh, you have to however understand um, the test that you're using and the characteristics of that test and be able to apply it within the clinical context 
uh, and also know uh, from experience when you're able to confidently answer the question that you're posing and when you just don't have the information available to answer that question. And when you don't have confidence that you that you can answer the question or the test is not uh, sensitive or specific enough, then you can always go back to what you would have done without ultrasound. And I think that's one of the keys, being able to know how to integrate it into your clinical practice and when you're not able to confidently rely on the answer uh, that you can answer the questions. And how many of the patients that you do an ultrasound on would you then get a formal ultrasound on top of that? Do you have numbers on that? Do you, do you audit those? I guess it depends what the question you're answering is. Uh, for example, if I have a patient who presents with uh, undifferentiated uh, upper abdominal or epigastric pain, um, my differential may include several different diagnoses like gastritis or pancreatitis or gallstone disease. Uh, and I would use point of care ultrasound in that setting to answer the question, does the patient have gallstones? Now, if, they, if I get good views and I'm confident uh, that I can answer that question, uh, that they don't have gallstones, then at that point I would move on uh, and uh, uh, disposition the patient based on the other differentials and the likelihood of those. So in that setting, I may not get a formal ultrasound. However, if I do identify gallstones and the patient's going to need to see a surgeon potentially, then a formal ultrasound would be requested. And it's very, it's very, um, it, it's specific to the particular application that you're using, and, and there's really no one answer to that question. So I guess if um, you've been using this now since 2014, about five or five or mm. so years. That's right. Yeah. Over this time, do you have? I'm guessing you've got a, a number of examples of uh, when ultrasound has contributed positively to the way that you manage patients are you able to maybe just talk briefly on one, one of those or give an example of how it's how it significantly changed your management uh yeah sure there's um there's, there's many examples there's uh one case of a, a woman in her 70s that i saw a couple of years ago and her presenting complaint was uh, of that of leg pain which she'd had for about four days and uh, this had started after she'd had a fall she'd collapsed felt dizzy and collapsed in the street uh, and was taken to the hospital uh, and prior to this she'd been suffering from gastroenteritis for about four or five weeks but was improving and it was thought that the collapse was likely due to dehydration from this ongoing gastroenteritis and she was rehydrated and subsequently discharged. And then four days later, when she came to see me, she was she was worried um, that she might have a clot in her leg, but was also uh, not sure whether she'd injured her leg during the during the fall a few days before. Uh, her she looked also a little bit um, puffed walking from the waiting room and admitted to having a cough and some shortness of breath for uh, about six weeks. Uh, and when I examined her, she had uh, a non-tender leg, but it was a bit more swollen than the other side, and she was a little bit tachycardic. Uh, and the ultrasound in this setting confirmed that she had uh, a DVT on that side. She had a femoral vein clot, which extended down to the popliteal fossa. And uh, when I looked at her heart, she had uh, signs of right heart strain. So she had a dilated right ventricle and a flattened intraventricular septum, which are signs of <coughs> right ventricular pressure overload. So in the context of her presentation, uh, it was now clear that she had a DVT and probable submassive PE, and she was referred up to the hospital and a CT scan confirmed that. So I think in this setting, uh, it's likely her collapse was related to PE at that, at that stage four days prior uh, and I'm sure given the leg swelling we would have eventually have identified the pathology but the the ultrasound really uh, 
focused the diagnosis and made it a lot more certain and, and made um, it much easier to refer that patient uh, rapidly rather than waiting for other investigations. And I guess the that's one of the benefits of this is that you were referring somebody with a much more complete picture that you'd been quite quickly able to establish in your clinic without sending the patient off to uh, somewhere else or without having to maybe make a judgment call with less information and, mm. and maybe it mm. so it cleared the fog a little bit but yeah. in terms of the, maybe with that person when you phone the hospital how do they re react to you when they when you tell them that you've done point of care ultrasound do you get any kind of dismissals from any of the um, admitting um, physicians at the hospital when you talk to them yeah my, my experience on that is is varied um, I find that uh, hospital doctors who are familiar with the use of point of care ultrasound are generally very receptive. So the emer I have a good relationship with the emergency doctors at, uh, at Wellington ED and uh, they have um, you know, a very extensive ultrasound program there and, and they're all, um, uh, you know, they're very... Um, accepting and, and pleased that these scans are done in the communities to, to provide that extra information. Uh, similarly, some of the cardiology registrars um, are surprised but pleased with the extra information that comes by way of a referral of a patient, uh, as are maybe the, the obstetric and gynaecology registrars who, who are also pleased and somewhat surprised that they get this information in the referrals. Uh, some other other specialties are a little bit more sceptical and I find that the information is maybe somewhat overlooked or dismissed, but um, it, it's, a, it's a, a struggle we're hopefully slowly winning. And I guess it, it must help you in those situations as it's coming to the end of the evening and the clinic might be closing when you don't have access to formal ultrasounds but the alternative is a referral to these people and you know to the specialties at the hospital and asking them hey I don't think I can send this person home because I can't rule this out so you're probably they're not seeing this because you're probably not referring as many people because you're mm. able to say oh no this person doesn't have a DVT this person can go home tonight rather than does this person have a large um, above knee DVT and are they safe to go home until we've looked into it? And so I guess yeah. I guess they don't see the ones that you're not now sending in. Um, but it would, that, that's right. The um, I, I think the benefits of point of care ultrasound uh, they're not always dramatic. You don't always uh, find you know a, a very dramatic diagnosis, or it doesn't always uh, greatly shift your diagnostic focus. But the gains are often small and cumulative, um, but significant. For example, along the lines of, uh, of what you were just describing, I saw a patient a couple of weeks ago in, uh, in his 50s who presented with what sounded like renal colic, but he'd never had renal colic in the past. Uh, and he settled down with some pain relief. And I guess the question in, in our minds when somebody's uh, approaching 60 is the possibility of a AAA and, and maybe in this case it, it wasn't that likely but I was able to rule out the patient having a AAA and avoid sending him to the ED for further investigation and, and subsequently he had outpatient investigation and so it, it uh, ultrasound can sometimes avoid the need for hospital referral it can make a hospital referral more focused or more direct. Uh, and sometimes it's as simple as uh, really decluttering your mind in terms of a differential diagnosis and help, and help uh, offload some of those diagnoses that you might be worried about, which you can then focus uh, on the other parts of your differential. And you mentioned they're not always dramatic, but you have got some dramatic cases which we are not going to... Uh, spoil just now because in subsequent uh, podcasts you're going to do some case histories mm. which will cover some of these so um, your five-year history of accumulating interesting cases will, will we will be tapping into that at a later date um, 
but um, it's interesting you mentioned that that patient you just had recently we had one this very week in the clinic I work in and it was the very same thing uh, uh, old enough to be concerned about um, uh, triple A's mm. and the this particular person got referred to the emergency department and they did point of care ultrasound there to exclude it because we had no other way of doing it and when the ultrasound clinics are closed and you've got that possibility that it could be that you can't send that person home so <clears throat> the, the difference for us was this person became an ed statistic whereas right. for you it wasn't that's right and it, it it has benefits both on saving work at the emergency department and also as i mentioned before sort of this cognitive offloading so you, you know, the diagnosis that you may be worried about if you sent that patient home uh, it has been excluded, and so so you don't have to waste mental energy worrying about that possibility. And we've mentioned ED have embraced this into their training, and it's become a feature of emergency department medicine. Do you see it becoming a feature of urgent care? Oh, absolutely. I I think that this uh, the the ball's already rolling, uh, and in New Zealand, for example, there are. Now, uh, at least three other urgent care centres that are in the process of purchasing or have purchased uh, ultrasound equipment and are in the process of training their staff. So I think it, it, it's taken a while, but um, there are, there's definitely some momentum. And I think urgent care is particularly well placed to be able to uh, develop urgent uh, point of care ultrasound partly because we are a relatively small specialty there's a relatively small number of clinics but we see a large number of patients every year many of whom uh, would benefit from having these specific questions answered and so I think it'll be uh, relatively easy to get a, a wide coverage of point of care ultrasound within a short space of time, given that we've got a, a relatively small number of clinics. I think it's, it's, it's when rather than if. Now we're going to go into this in a, in a further podcast, uh, a little bit more depth about the training and the recertification and all the um, the peer group stuff that you have to do and, and the costs and, and everything involved in this. So if anybody is interested uh, in learning more about this, you're going to talk in more depth uh, in, in, a, in a further podcast. Um, but just briefly, what for those listening now who are maybe thinking, this is interesting, I'm, you know, you've, you've lit the little light bulb that you had lit in 2012. Where would you advise they start maybe having a look and um, and, and finding out some more information to, to maybe satisfy that little itch that started? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I think uh, once you become aware of uh, that point of care ultrasound is actually a thing and how it could be used in urgent care, I think one of the things that was really helpful for me was to do a short course uh, to get a better understanding of, of the scope and, and, and how you go about performing it in your practice. And that doesn't necessarily mean you will have equipment in your practice to go back and use it, but it will give you a taster. Uh, I did uh, Scott Bowman's course. Um, there's a website called wellingtonultrasound.com and I think he's got a course coming up later in the year in November. And I believe there are some courses uh, arranged also later in the year, which members could contact the college about uh, to see whether there's space on those. But a two-day course is really a great, a great way to get a, a good insight into the use of ultrasound and urgent care. There's also a vast number of uh, open access medical education resources on, on the web. There are the multiple podcasts, and some of the, some of the good ones would be uh, the, ultrasoundpodcast.com and five minutes sino.com are, are two good American based emergency to, uh, medicine uh, focused podcasts. Uh, and so people could start there uh, to see what it's all about. And it's also worth mentioning that people can go to urgentcareultrasound.co.nz, which is a, a blog that you yourself write and post 
um, cases on there. And what's uh, fascinating is you can you, you post images, so moving images of, of ultrasounds, so people you know to augment the case. So um, one thing that we'll be doing in the future is you'll be presenting some cases here in podcast form, and people will be able to see the images um, on your website. So. Um, they should definitely bookmark um, urgentcareultrasound.co.nz and you link also there to a lot of the other things that you just mentioned. So, um, I would just um, just make a, a comment that the case we talked about before, the, the lady with the pulmonary embolus, if people are interested in looking at the images of, of that case, it's case number four on the website. And as, as you said, Guy, when we present a case uh, in future episodes, we'll link that through to the website uh, with the images, so that people can listen to the listen to the story and look at the images at the same time. Excellent. So I hope uh, people have had a taster. Those of you who aren't aware of uh, Pocus as a as an entity, um, hopefully you've had your eyes open. Those of you who have heard of it, maybe uh, hearing Kelvin has um, fanned those flames a little bit more. And as I say, there will be a further podcast where um, we're going to go into a bit more depth about how here in New Zealand, at least, you can uh, go into training and implementing this into your practice, including questions like how much does this equipment cost? Um, because it's surprising how that barrier has dropped. I was very surprised when I learnt. I won't spoil it now, but it's it's much cheaper than than you would have imagined. So thank you, Kelvin, for um, giving us this introduction to point of care ultrasound. You're certainly at the the leading edge of urgent care ultrasound here in New Zealand. So um, it's uh, it, it's something that's only going to grow from here. So we'll we'll obviously be in touch and hear more from you in future podcasts. But for now, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Guy, and uh, I really look forward to our upcoming chats. My thanks to Kelvin for talking to our podcast. As we mentioned, there will be an extended talk covering things in a bit more depth for those of you who have had their appetite for poker sweated. We will look at the training requirements, the costs, equipment costs, quality assurance, and those sorts of details. Look out for it on our podcast feed in the coming weeks. We will also be having regular POCUS case histories featuring on the podcast so we can highlight how POCUS can add to your patient management. As always, if you have any questions, comments, suggestions or corrections, email podcast at rnzcuc.org.nz. We'll be back next week with another podcast. I look forward to seeing you all then, but for now... Thanks for listening.